an expert, an authority, a connoisseur, a specialist, a professional, a knowledge king, a rock and roll sports talker. Coons Ford of Security Boulevard is proud to present The Sports Maven with Bruce Posner, a no-holds-barred look at the sports world. Now, here's Bruce Posner, The Sports Maven. Welcome in, everybody, after just a tremendous weekend at sports, not so much for the Capitals and the uh, and the Wizards, but that's old news. But on the phone right now, uh, we have someone to talk about Rivalry Week, but also about the Ravens' tremendous, in my opinion, pick in the first round, Lamar Jackson. He covers football for ESPN. He's the, uh, he's the lacrosse maven for ESPN as well. And that, of course, is Quinn Kessinich. Welcome in, Quinn. Good morning, Bruce. Great to talk to you. All right, first, before we get to the game today and also the ACC tournament and uh, lacrosse landscape, I have to ask you about the Ravens' pick of Lamar Jackson. Were you surprised? I mean, you think it's a good pick? How do you stand on it? I like it. You know, I had Lamar this year at Florida State when, when he beat the Seminoles. And, and you know, I, I thought over the course of the season he was trying to prove to the NFL scouts and GMs that he, that he was a true pocket passer. I think he's got loads of talent, tremendous speed, um, throws a deep ball with, with more touch that, than people think and uh, people realize. So I, I like that pick. I, I think Lamar is, is a terrific player. When I look at some of the other quarterbacks, I had seen Darnold and Rosen this year. I, I had made Baker Mayfield a year ago. Uh, you know, I, I like Darnold. I like Rosen. And, and I, I would put Lamar number three if, if I was uh, you know, grading those guys. I think you can safely say you cover all these guys, all right, on football and ESPN, and uh, he is, without question, the most exciting player in football, in my opinion. It's coming, I mean, college football anyway. But, you know, people, you know, his passing's gotten better, but he can do anything. And I think that that's an asset that uh, excites the fans in Baltimore, and they sure needed some excitement, Quint. Yeah, you know, uh Playmakers, exactly. You know, our, our lack of wide receiver playmakers is, is still in, an issue. But but Lamar offers, uh, you know, hope and, and a change up for Flacco this year in, in the least. And let's see how he develops and, and uh, he can become a franchise quarterback. Yeah, it was funny. Somebody said on, I think it was on the uh, ESPN coverage, that uh, Flacco is now on the clock. All right, because they're the guy who can be groomed into replacing him eventually. And uh, with the money and the cap and all that stuff, Flacco, I think he will have a good year, though. I think the addition of, of Hayden Hurst was tremendous for him. I, would, I was really upset that they didn't take D.J. Moore. Obviously, for some reason, they didn't like him because they kept dropping when they could have gotten him. So I think that was clear. My only issue with Hayden Hurst, and, and I covered him two years ago when South Carolina played uh, Tennessee, is his age, you know, minor league baseball, I believe, for a couple of years. He's, he's, he's older, you know, so he's been bullying younger players. I think he might be 25 years old. Uh, I, I, I forget, but that is, I, I like him. I think he's a good kid uh, and a very good player, but, but I worry that, that he's uh, already, you know, two years past his, uh, his expiration date. Well, the, the Ravens backed that thought up maybe by taking Mark Andrews from Oklahoma, who had a great season a lot because of Johnny, uh, Johnny, because of Baker Mayfield. That was a great offense. I mean, but, but my, my, biggest, uh, my biggest question mark with Baker Mayfield going forward is that's the air raid system. I mean, that, that, you have uh, Lincoln Riley, who, who was with, uh, I believe, East Carolina, and, you know, originally was within the Texas Tech and Baylor family of offense. And those quarterbacks have never really translated into the NFL system. It's different routes. It's different quarterback mechanics, and and in Baker Mayfield's case, he was surrounded by just just loads and loads of talent. You think about the running backs, the wide receivers, and some of these linemen, and now a tight end. Uh, so he was put in, in every possible position to succeed. So I, I don't like the Browns' first round pick. All right, let's move over to uh, lacrosse. Uh, your your super expertise, but has Syracuse maybe played themselves onto the bubble? Absolutely, seven and six. They've got uh, five out-of-conference losses. And the thing about those losses, Bruce, their RPI is 12 right now. So they're going to be put in a spot where, where now the committee next week will, will compare them 
head to head to teams like Cornell, who they lost to, to Rutgers, who they lost to, maybe to Johns Hopkins, who they lost to. So they, they lost five out of conference games that that could really hurt them. Their RPI is really low. They play Colgate next Saturday, and they need to win to go to eight and six. And then they'll be in consideration. And, and you think about bid stealers. These are lower-ranking teams who jump up and upset people for automatic qualifiers and really take away bids from some good at-large teams. So the Syracuse fans are rooting against any bid stealing. Yeah, well, even in the case of the Big Ten, you, if Ohio State would jump up and win the tournament, and they're certainly capable of it, that would also throw everything. It would certainly throw a team like Syracuse into potential free fall in their minds because they, that's what you have to avoid. Uh, what is it with the ACC tournament that it's like always upsets? I, you know, it, I guess it shows you how close these teams are grouped in the first place during the regular season. And then when so much is at stake for one team, how they can rise up and, and, and play better when their backs are against the wall, because that, that's what we saw last night. You know, Notre Dame absolute positively playing elimination game played their best game of the year. They got healthy. We saw flashes. Like, their Maryland loss early in the year, Bruce, I don't know if you saw that game, when they put up 10 on the Terps. They played well. They, they played great. Yeah, they, they played great. with a win over Denver. And so, at that moment, I'm like, wow, this is the best Notre Dame offense I've seen in a long time. Uh, injuries, dysfunction, you know, weeks later, they're not playing well, but they bounced back last night. It was a great performance. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, if form holds now and Maryland is the number one seed, or they might not, there's certainly no lock on that, I'll tell you that much, with the way they've been playing. But uh, I saw some of the early bracketologies. They got a Denver-Notre Dame rematch with the winner playing Maryland in the quarterfinals. It's a pretty strong quarterfinal game. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you know, the Terps, you make a good point, because the Terps won those back-to-back games against Penn State and Rutgers, and they were not playing their best ball. Anyone who's watched them play the defense, the face-offs, you know, too much reliance on Kelly and Bernhardt, I, I think they play their best game of the year later this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Uh, let's talk about that. This, uh, first of all, you were certainly a member of Johns Hopkins, uh, a goalie for Johns Hopkins. What, what did rivalry, rivalry Week mean to you when you were Johns Hopkins? Well, you know, it was exciting. My freshman year, we went down to Maryland and played in front of a record crowd at the time, 19,000, when the Terps were undefeated, and, and they took it to us pretty good. I remember walking on the field and being like, holy cow, these guys are athletes. They had Warstel, who was on the basketball team, and Mike Mosco, who was like six foot five, Brendan Hanley, and uh, Jimmy Beardmore. They, they just had so many athletes. I felt like I was a little kid. You know, for the first time in college, I'm like, man, I feel like I'm 14 years old playing against a bunch of men. We, we were fortunate enough to beat that same team in the semifinals uh, up at Rutgers when I think Maryland started reading their press clippings. You know, they had a scoring margin that year, Bruce, of like plus 10. They were, beating, they were undefeated and beating everyone by almost an average of 10 goals a game. And I remember entering that game saying, I just don't want to be embarrassed in front of my, <laughs> my, friends, my friends and my family. I'm like, this, this game's on national TV. A lot of people will be watching it for the first time since I left Long Island. You know, all my high school friends. I just hope I don't get embarrassed. And, and our coaching staff did a great job, and we upset them. And then I felt for the rest of my career at Hopkins that I kind of had a mental edge against Maryland, like that we had ripped their heart out and that they weren't going to beat us. And, and we beat them uh, the remaining three years. And I just felt such confidence and like, hey, if you couldn't beat us in 87, you ain't going to beat us in 89 or, eight, eight, you know, 90. And and so that's that's kind of how I always viewed the, the rivalry. But it, it was intense. I mean, one year I remember I got hit by Brendan Hanley hit me in 1988 right before halftime. I came out of the goal, made a play, and I had a concussion. I couldn't see out of out of one of my eyes, and I stayed in the game in the second half. My defense and we started giving up goals, and I'm like, hey guys, you got to get out and play the guy. Don't let him shoot. I'll, I'll tell you later, but just get out and play the guy. <laughs> And and I, I faked my way to a one goal win. I, you know, by today's standards, I would have been sitting on the bench. Probably for the rest of the season. Yeah, for for a week <laughs> or two. Yeah. Uh, that brings me to the point. I, it would be an absolute shame if Shaq Stanwick isn't able to play today. I don't know if you've heard anything, any update on that, but getting information out of Petra Milo. I, yeah, no, we were told yesterday that he is a game time decision today. So. That's positive because initially I heard that it was uh, severe to the point that maybe his season was in jeopardy. So we, we, we will see. He's a big part of the Hopkins offense. It's senior day for the Jays. 
and he would be the last of the sandwich. So it'd be eight straight years for uh, Dorian Wells, uh, his mom and dad, and I'm sure they'll have a, a big contingent of, of, of fans there today. It's going to be a pretty emotional senior ceremony when, when they honor Jeremy Huber, who's uh, as a freshman passed away, and, and he would have been a senior today. Uh, his birthday was, was this week, and his parents from Las Vegas will be there. Yeah, it's funny you say that. Last week, Maryland and Ohio State, I'm on the field, I'm on the field for senior day. And the parents are there, and they're having a great time, and they're hugging each other. And I looked at Tills before I went up to the stands, and he had that look on his face like, man, why do we have to go through this? You know? And sure enough, Maryland came out as flat as they've had yeah. maybe in three years, all right, since the time they lost to uh, Ohio State, the tournament at Maryland. They were... Quinn, they were flat as a pancake. It was three to nothing before you could blink. Coaches can't stand those senior day ceremonies. They they really they really hate them in in all sports, whether it's football, basketball, lacrosse. The key there as an athlete is to celebrate. But but then when you go in the locker room, you, you got to recalibrate and you and you got to get your mind back on business, uh, mentally and physically. You know you've warmed up, then you kind of cool down, and then you try to rev it up again. So when you come back on the field, it's important. You know, to maybe do some short sprints to stretch, to throw the ball around. You, you just have to be aware that you're vulnerable to be soft when the game starts. And they were. And if you look at the final score, twelve to ten, and three to nothing after a minute, it's a different game. But you know, I once asked, asked Petromala about what makes a team great when they win a lot of one goal games. What's the difference? And he, he just talked about preparation and the usual stuff. What do you think about that? There's so many one-goal games in lacrosse, and yet the better team normally wins the one-goal game. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a combination of, of things, Bruce. You know, preparation, obviously, but the, the ability to make a play at, at a critical moment, at, a, at a, a stressful moment, and then to have the poise and also win a game when you don't particularly play well. You know, and I think that Maryland's done that tremendously in the John Tillman era. Like, they're not always firing on all cylinders, but somebody's playing well enough where they can win, whether it's the face-off guys, whether it's the defense wins one for you, and maybe next week it's the offense, your specialties. So, so over the course of the season, you say, you know, everyone contributed to a win here and there. It's, it's like having a baseball lineup that's not reliant on one or two guys, and everybody's pulling the rope, so to speak. And I think that's why Maryland and Johns Hopkins, and you look at Syracuse in the last couple of years, why they've been good at one-goal games. Uh, because somewhere along the line, different guys step up. It's not, they're not relying on, on one star at crunch time. Yeah, it's funny. The last two national championships for Johns Hopkins were triggered by wins over Maryland at a crucial point in their season when they needed, when they needed to win. Last year... All right, when Maryland playing Johns Hopkins, I was talking to Colin uh, Heacock's brother, and he said, uh, Ryan Heacock, I'm sure you know him. And, yeah. And he said to me before the game, he said, Bruce, we're going to come out and we're going to put it to this team, and it's going to be our trigger to the national championship. And, and that's why Paul Rabel once said that uh, before his last, his senior Maryland Hopkins game, he said it was the most important game of his life, even though he had already won a title. This game has more significance than meets the eye of seeding and stuff like that. Do you agree with that? Yeah, it, it's a springboard. I, I, but I think emotionally, you know, how this thing shakes itself out. Does Maryland come to town, put it together again, and assert themselves as, no, 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 we're the, we're the best team in the country here. You're still Johns Hopkins. you struggled in recent years, especially late in the season. Or do they win by one goal? Or does Hopkins win by one? Or does Hopkins make a statement? So I think the way it, it, it plays out for an athlete sometimes, like in your heart, when, when we lost to Syracuse uh, when I was a senior in 1990, I, it just got the feeling in our locker room that, like, we could play that team 100 times. I'm not sure we'd ever beat them, even on our best day. And, and so that's where... And other times I was on the opposite end of that scenario. When we beat a team and, like, we own that team, they can't beat us. So, so I think going forward, it's like, what's your perception of yourself and how does it relate? You, you try to erase the chalkboard to say, you know, hey, next time we play, him, any, anything can happen, we can win. But sometimes you kind of know in your heart, like, wow, they're just a little better than us. 
Speaking of that, now whoever wins today, I mean, next week they could happen again. What do you think about I know. that? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm look. I, I get the automatic qualifier system. We have nine automatic qualifiers, and it's great for the leagues like the NEC and the MAC and the America East. But the redundancy of now playing a team twice and potentially three times in a year, I just don't like. You know, I, I, I don't know what the solution is. Do we have a set of a tournament? Do we just cross? Do we have a Big Ten? ACC Challenge? Do we have a America East, Big East Challenge? You know, and, and instead of playing these repeater games, maybe you see Maryland play someone from the Maryland plays, uh, you know, someone from the ACC that Duke. they didn't play. Maryland, Maryland plays, Duke. plays uh, Duke or Virginia or, 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 or Syracuse. And, and Johns Hopkins, you know, plays somebody that they plays Notre Dame. Uh, and we learn more, and maybe that's even more, give, give the, give the, the, the league championship to the regular season, you know, they played. Someone's proved to be the best. And then those games will actually maybe be more beneficial in terms of NCAA selection committee. Yeah, that's a great point, Quinn, because it, it gets a little ridiculous. Here they're going to make, they're each going to play Rutgers or, or Penn State or whoever the other two teams are, and they've just played them within three weeks, and then they possibly could play each other again. I, I you know, it's great. It's great, I guess. But what does it mean if Maryland wins by three today and Hopkins wins by three next week? You know, exactly. It, if someone's going to call themselves a Big Ten champ, like look at the ACC. Virginia, they won one regular season ACC game. Uh, Notre Dame won one regular season ACC game, nine seven over Virginia, and they have these two teams are the ones that are playing in the conference tournament for a league trophy. Ah, uh, agreed. All right. Quinn, give me the game. Give me the game summary. I mean, I've been so impressed with how Hopkins kind of turned their seasons around and the growth of Connor D. Simone and Cole Williams is a beast out there. And Kyle Marr seems to have it have it running. And of course, Tinney is Tinney, and we don't have to go through Maryland. I talk about him all the time. How do you see this game today? Well, you know, Maryland's been a great first quarter team this year, and, and when they get the lead, they're almost unbeatable under John Tillman. I was surprised last week when our statistician, Russ Berlin, was sitting right next to me right now, Bruce, as we make our way back to uh, Charm City. He pointed out that, you know, John Tillman, I think it's like 0-5 when trailing entering the fourth quarter, uh, 0-6, and so they're not built for comebacks. Mar- Maryland's a methodical front-running team, you know, like a, like a team with a great running game in football. So I think the lead is essential for them. And then for Hopkins... What stood out this year is their ability to go on these massive goal-scoring runs and to score in a variety of ways, transition, nice ball movement. Uh, you, know, you think about their Delaware game, 7-0 run. You, you think about the, the end of, of uh, the Virginia game. They were down 9-2. to It's the biggest comeback in Division One lacrosse this year. Down seven goals, and they won. So they've been able to go on those emotional, monstrous runs, and that will happen sometime today, and the crowd will get into it. And it's up to Maryland to keep that to a three-goal run or less. Uh, you know, Hopkins is going to deliver that haymaker. Deal with it. You give up two or three in a row, no big deal. But don't make it a four or five-goal run. Correct. What worries me today about Maryland, and I, I love the team. I mean, the fact that Tillman could lose his attack entirely, lose Timmy Moeller, and, you know, 10-2 and and number one of the country speaks volumes about his ability to both recruit and to coach. I, I mean, it's been fantastic. But i got to ask you about one guy, and that's Logan Wisnowskis. Are you surprised about how successful he's been, or is it just a case that this kid really fits into the system? Yeah, he's got a role that does fit, but, but you know, I know Syracuse liked him a lot last year when he redshirted there. There were some players on that Syracuse team who were begging John Desco to take off his red shirt. And, and they were, you know, based on what they, they were seeing in practice, they're like, Coach, you know, he can play. And, and Desco decided to red shirt him, and, and that proved not to be the right fit. So he comes down to Maryland. He's a great shooter with his feet set on that wing, especially in transition. I mean, he lights up goalies. I haven't seen a goalie make a good stop on, on his mid-range shot all season. And he's a better passer than people think. You know, what he lacks in foot speed, and I watched him play a lot in high school, he's a good passer. You know, he, he can lean into a guy and actually pass over the top of a defender because he's so tall. Uh, not going to run by you, but, but really talented around the net, also around the crease, he's got good fakes, and he rarely misses his one-on-one opportunity. So he's a nice fit. 
as, as a lefty shooter. Right. You know, he kind of reminds me of that wing that Maryland seems to have had, especially with like Grant Catalino, a guy not that fast, but could really fire the ball and just had the ability to score on that angle. And he's done it so many times this year. Uh, of course, it helps to have Connor Kelly just feeding you absolutely perfect and Jaron Bernhardt. It doesn't take away from it. But uh Wow, he's been a, a big surprise, as has uh, Bubba Fairman. We expected Bubba Fairman. Yeah. And uh, Tillman was high on uh, Wisnowskis from day one, from the first day of practice. So uh, Maryland's been fortunate. The transfers worked out in their favor there. Quint, that's going to do it. Uh, so are you going back to Virginia to do the championship? Yeah, I'll drive back with Rush tonight. <laughs> Why would yeah. you just stay there? Uh, we'll come to this Hopkins game at 2. I'll, I'll go home, change, pick out an outfit for tomorrow, and, and head on down to Charlottesville. So. Who's doing the Hopkins game today? Uh, Mike Corey, Don Zimmerman, and myself. Oh, you're doing the Oh, great. Well, I'll see you there then. And uh, Hey, yeah. I'm 67 years old, and I couldn't sleep last night waiting for this game. That's how no, much- I know. That was like the other day, uh, Clark and, and uh, Nish Roth, my, my uh, comrades down at the ACC, were like, what are we doing during the off day? I'm like, I'm kind of tempted to drive back to Baltimore. This was weeks ago. And then when when the game, I'm like, can I work that game? I was asking my boss this. They're like, yeah, you can work that game. So, like, where would I rather be than Hopkins, Maryland? You there is no but Let me tell you. Hopkins, Maryland at Homewood in April is what lacrosse and Baltimore is all about. That's exactly right. All right? That's how I feel about it. And to me, you know, I, I always wish it was a week later when it's a little bit warmer, but this is what lacrosse is about. And, you, you know, as a Maryland guy, and you certainly as a Hopkins guy, you, I don't have to explain that. Yeah, no, it's, it's always great to see former players of both schools and the fans and the kids and the colors. You know, there's going to be a lot of red out there, and uh, it's going to be a great afternoon. Quint, I'll see you there, and thanks a lot for coming on. I really appreciate it. Sure, Bruce. All right, take care. All right, Quint Kessinger. Obviously, I'm fond of Quint. All right, obviously. Great guy, great lacrosse, and now he's big time in football. I mean, he's on every big game, bowl games. Uh, I think he might have done a national championship, but uh, very, very knowledgeable guy. With that, we'll head out to our first break. This is Bruce Posner. You're listening to Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Welcome back to Sports Maven, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, once again, here's Bruce Posner, Sports Maven. Hi, right, back here on segment two, and uh, what a great day for the Ravens it was. I'm not gonna let's bring in Wayne Viner. I'm not gonna. Br- I'm not gonna say I wasn't disappointed that the Ravens three times decided not to take DJ Moore. They could have had him at 16. They traded him at 22. They could have had him at 22, two times. And they traded down to 25, Wayne. Obviously, they didn't want him. Well, you picked up a wide receiver from New Orleans that I think is, is fairly good. And I'm surprised that New Orleans didn't match. And I think that took them out of the wide receiver game for the moment. So they had made their choice earlier that they wanted to uh, make a different kind of splash. A tight and end. they certainly yeah. did. But the last pick was, I, I, I have to tell you, and I tell the audience, and you know, to me, the last three seasons of Ravens games, or last two seasons, have literally been hard to watch. It is just hard to watch their games. And they're not a 2-14 and 14 team. They were 8-8 eight eight, uh, last year. I mean, but the games were so dull. The offense was so dull that I, I think they had to make a splash. And I don't know if you heard Quinn Kessinich. He's a big big Lamar Jackson fan. He's covered him, and uh, he thinks he's, you know, maybe Josh Rosen, Sam Darnold might be a step ahead, but he likes him better in Mayfield. He likes him better than all the other guys out there. And also, as a passer, a pocket passer, he's developed into one. I think that's going to turn out to be an absolutely fantastic pick for the Ravens. I think it's interesting that you pick up RG3, who certainly had a game before he was injured, but resembles what you have there now. And then you bring in a a guy who's the RG3 of today. Now, he's not going to have to play right away. That might have helped RG3's development if he didn't have to come start for the Redskins. Well, RG3, 
Uh, the Ravens have never kept more than two quarterbacks. So his future is not good unless they decide to go real slow with, uh, with Jackson, which could really – RG3 is going to have to really impress in spring in the exhibition games, and he'll get his chance. Uh, but all of a sudden now, I look forward to the exhibition games to see Lamar Jackson. And I got to tell you, you know, I never look forward. Where do the, where do the Ravens play, at Washington or in Baltimore? Do you know? I, I don't even know. What? I guess last year you went to the game, it was in Baltimore. Right. right. Well, it's probably in D.C. this year. But we might have to go to that one, Wayne, because I, I, I really, you know, I know you're a huge Lamar Jackson fan. I don't know how you can't be, to tell you the truth. But uh, – Looking forward to that. It's here, guys. It's, it's here. here. Yeah. There you go, yeah. Wayne. You're my guest if you want. August 30th, 2018. Yeah, that's that's exciting. That is exciting. Uh, now tell me about Darius Geese, who was uh, dropped at 59, uh, LSU running back. You seem to have liked him to the Redskins. What was it that made him drop? What did he do that was so bad? It's, well, a couple things. <laughs> One is a public report that he complained to the NFL that one of the teams that interviewed him asked him if he liked men and also asked too many questions about his mother's background. The NFL, according to Adam Schefter and that gang, investigated this, took it seriously. And from what I can figure out, the NFL records all of these sessions. And the NFL says this never happened. So that's one strike. The second thing is that, uh, according to Jordan, our lead writer for Talk Redskins, that Geist has been late to several meetings. So there's an overall cloud that he somewhat disrespects this process. It's caused a little bit of trouble, and it cost him possibly 20 or 30 spots in the draft. There was talk of him being a first-round pick, and we looked into him as a first-round pick for the Redskins. And it's going to be interesting to see if this bubbles up again. Well, you know what he sounds but, like to me? The perfect Redskin. All right. <laughs> Chaos. Chaos. Well, they're, oh, they're good at that. When it comes to Darius Geist, there was a lot of uh, cloud over him going into yesterday's because there was reports that apparently there's a TMZ quote unquote bombshell that they were waiting to drop until after he was drafted. And apparently, I mean, there's now been all these rumors. The same thing happened with uh, who was it with Josh Allen the day before with his old tweets getting released, and people are suspecting that other teams are trying to leak this stuff to try to have players fall. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about that, but there has been reports that there's going to be a TMZ quote unquote bomb shell story now tmz themselves are denying it but there there's been rumors that there's going to be another uh, uh shoe to drop in the darius guy situation well, well the biggest shoe that dropped after the draft i guess was two years ago with uh laramie Tunsil. but that was the, before the draft that was right as the draft was starting yeah, but what did that do drop him to 12 or yeah, something? yeah exactly he still ended up in the first round yeah I, I, he he it, he's played every game for them mm-hmm. yeah he has started every game for the dolphins since they drafted him well you know, I, I'm not sure the crime of marijuana is a crime anymore, and uh, I'm sure the NFL's looking into that. But more important to me right now is the meeting that the NCAA generated where they're talking about doing away with the one and done. And to me, that's been something that has really hurt Maryland. And they even talked about the baseball rule of three years, either if you look Except a scholarship, three years, but then all of a sudden it was like it was deemed to be not necessary. I think that's a major mistake. I think two years would be a, a great compromise, and also about players being able to sell their images and sell uh, and sign autographs and stuff. What would be wrong with that, Wayne? That they have the rights to their own likeness. Yeah, and, and I mean, they look. Well, they deem it to be. Uh, being a professional at that point. What is a professional anymore? I mean, I mean the whole thing. Look at the Olympics. Well, is that amateurish anymore? I mean, it's 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 absurd. It really is. It's just uh, let the kids make money if they can. If they have the name to carry, 
let him make money instead of going to school and not being like a real student not being able to you know have a car and and to go out to eat and uh and to uh be able to buy what you want to a point i mean it's it's just not fair and um uh, maybe i think it would help a lot and one thing it would do is fully bring back the ncaa football game that you could used to be able to play on your computer or your laptop or whatever that, that got thrown out because of the Ed Bannon case. And I think Ed Bannon was correct that the NCAA was selling his likeness to EA Sports and people buying these games, and he didn't get a penny out of it, even today. And that was one of the issues, is if you want to say that's okay for four years, but when you graduate, you should get paid for that. And the NCAA at that point said, no, you cannot get paid for that. It's still our property, and the NCAA lost that case, and there's no more college sports games. There's a Madden NFL game. There's no college game. There's an NBA computer game. There's no college game because of that. Well, a couple of players at Ohio State got quite upset that Ohio State was selling the photos of them, the player, with Ohio State. The guy hasn't been there for 20 years, and they're still using that for advertising. And the player can't get a dime from that. And I think that there's my first real legit problem. If you want to say you're an amateur while you're in school, okay. You're not an amateur once you graduate. The school can't still make money off of your image, your likeness, for the rest of eternity. That's wrong. second thing that you brought up that I think makes some sense is that if you don't want to pay the student while he's in school, and we've talked about this on the air, off the air. If you want to sell a, a jersey of a player, then you take that money and you put that aside in escrow. And when the student's no longer in school, he gets his payment. So if you want to try and keep it clean, save the money for the kid, give it to him when he leaves. Bruce, back to you. Something has to be done. All right, I'm going to leave you with, uh, pushing the break. I'm going to leave you with one thing, all right? You know how I feel about Hopkins, Maryland today, right? If I'm 100%, I, when I tell you I didn't sleep last night, where does Wayne Viner stand on this game? Have you grown to 50% yet? The, uh, the 50% of? In other words, how, how important is this game to you in your mind? Oh, I think it's a great day. It's, a, it's the best day in lacrosse. People go to school for one place or another to go to this game. This is the one game, to me, that it, you sell all the tickets. They all had an overflow crowd last year. There's going to be 11,000 people at Homewood today. It's a big deal. The game itself, not whether you win or lose, just getting to be there is a pretty big game. So maybe I've hit 50% of what you think. Yeah, you know, okay. That's, that's we're, a- we're going out there early. We're going to have a good time. It, it's a great place. And I'm a Terp. I hope we win. If we don't win, it's still a great game. And well, that, that well says said. something right there. All right, last thing, Caps. Is this the greatest choking team ever, Wayne? Greatest choking team? Hey, at least they're good at something, Bruce. <laughs> I, I hope they can come back and win this series. There's no reason they shouldn't. But when I rewatched that game, boy, that, that final score could have been 12 to 11. There were so many goal opportunities for both teams. And I think more of them went to uh, Pittsburgh. So, uh, look, it's on. they're not coming back from too love to uh, Pittsburgh. All right? They're not going to Pittsburgh or winning two games. All right? it just, I don't think it can. I guess it can happen, but I don't think it will happen. But Somehow this series always seems to go seven games and ver- caps blow it at the end. Well, it could very well. I sure hope they do. And the Wizards, they're gone. You know, uh, is Scott Brooks going? No, I think they're going to use the John Wall injury and some flux there to say that this was an odd year for them. I'm not in love with that team. They're certainly my team. I root for them, and no doubt there. But this particular makeup of the team, I'm still not in love with this. There's certainly pieces missing, and I think when things start to go bad, they pout. And they they just don't seem to have the the right attitude to me. Things are going bad for the Raptors. 
they pick it up, their chemistry is much better. And I know I don't have an answer, but I just don't like the chemistry of this team. All right. With that, we'll head out. We'll see you over at Hopkins. Uh, we'll be there early and say hello if you see us. And uh, that'll about do it. Wayne, thanks a lot for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Go Terps. All right, this is Bruce Posner. You're listening to Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven. And let me talk about Coons Ford for one second. Uh, there's so many offers that you can't even go over. I mean, there's still some 0% cars. There's uh, They have so many trucks in stock, and certainly trucks has been the story of the week for Ford these days that uh, – they're, you know, they came out with this Eco Sport, and that's booming, and the Explorer is booming, the Edge is booming. All their trucks and their, you know, the standard of America is the F-150. Uh, best place in the world to buy a new car or truck from Coons Ford. I bought a ton of them. Dennis, great guy. And with that, we will head out to our first break, second break. This is Bruce Posner. You're listening to Coons Ford presents the Sports Maven. This is the Sports Maven Show, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, here's the Maven himself, Bruce Posner. All right, all apologies out to Chris Tillman. He looked fantastic yesterday. I've been, you know, I, I could not believe that Buck kept him, kept him in the rotation, but of course, Buck doesn't have much choice. Even a blind nut finds a squirrel every once in a while, Bruce. Yeah, it, it's like... Uh, he pitched good. He pitched good the other day. Just got hit in the fifth inning. But last night, seven innings, one hit ball. He's had, good against Detroit. Had some good. <laughs> listen, here's here's one of my problems with the Orioles right now. Number one, what do you do with Davis? See, if it was me, and and I ran the team, I'd say Chris, go down, spend ten days in Hagerstown. You don't have to go on the road. Just stay there or go drive there. Take batting practice, play in their games, get yourself back together because he's damaging the team and he's trying his heart out. I mean, I can't sit there and say he's like not trying, but he's giving it everything he has. But it's getting worse and worse. And now I got to tell you, when he comes up to bat, it's almost like you have to turn your head a little bit. It's like you just know the strikeout's going to come, or the double play, or the the dribbler, soft the fly up. ball hits high. He still hits high pop ups. I'll tell you that much. But it's painful. It's painful to watch. Now that you know, that's me. That's what I would do. The O's right now are seven and nineteen. Here's my problem when I take a look at it. If we go across the the pitching staff, we look at Dylan Bundy and we say. A good year for Dylan Bundy might be 15 wins. And that would be great considering he only has one after one-sixth of the season. Right. Then you look at uh, uh, Kashner, right? Right. And you say a good season for him would be about 12 wins. Yeah. All right. Then you look at Galsman and you could say 12 wins. Yes. 12 wins is doable. You could look at Tillman and say 10 wins. All right, there's mm-hmm. your starters, and Alex uh, Cobb. It should be 13, 12. Say 12 wins. 12 He's wins. missed a lot. He's started off hard. The problem with that stat. Let me finish. Okay. Let me finish. So with that, you got 27 and 24, so you got 61 wins. You know, give the bullpen 10, maybe 12 and you're staring at 90 losses. And you're still looking at less than that because you want to believe that they have the capability to earn those number of wins, but the lineup isn't producing behind them even if they were that good. I mean, it, it, But the you, lineup, the hitting will come as it gets warmer. I do believe that. I hope. As they get healthy, scope will the come. The approach up. isn't good, though. I mean, that's the problem. It's the same thing with last year. I mean, they would go on these runs where they would score runs for nine or ten games and it wouldn't fall in the same couple of weeks that the pitching was on. And even if the pitching is on, they're hitting home runs and they're, they're, they're solo shots. It's 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 a tough situation right now. Uh, I agree, but the hitting will come. I'm positive of it. Uh, Manny's you know Manny's hitting as good as he's he's ever hit early in the year. Uh, batting three fifty, I think. Uh, I just feel that when when uh, Scope comes back and there is a timetable now, when the lineup is back, they will hit fine and they will get the run support, but. It's just hard to look past 70 wins for this team. And 70 wins is 90 losses. Yes. And, you know, I'm also looking at those five guys and say, well, who might get hurt there? You know, somebody could get hurt. I mean, one out of five wouldn't be unusual. But uh, 
And Bundy at 15, I mean, with the way the support doesn't come to him, which I don't understand why, but that's an age-old problem. Yeah, at this point, it would be a lot to even expect 15 wins. I mean, the, the crazy thing is we're already a full month into the year right now, and uh, the the problem with that is it's gonna, these paces are already hard to meet. Uh, the fact that Ke- uh, Dylan Bundy is one of the best pitchers in the American League right now, and he has only one win, it would be it would be astronomical to wow, see. Wow, they hit him the out. other day. I was there. Yeah, right? I was there too. Yeah, I mean, Boy. I mean, it it was definitely his worst performance in in the better part of a year. But at the and same what's time, what's worse about that is after the second inning, game was over. Right. Well, but but. There's something to there's there, there's some sort of recompense that I take the fact that they were able to keep him in the game that he went into the sixth inning he didn't survive that sixth inning but I mean he gave up eight runs and and he still was a dog out there and it's annoying because it was the Rays the fact that he's giving up monster home runs to C J Crone and Wilson Ramos and those kinds of guys I mean that wasn't exactly reassuring but Bruce this team isn't very good. I mean, I mean, really? I, I mean, uh, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I, 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 you were there. I'm, I'm sure you had the same thought that I've goes been over. almost every game. Let right. me tell you, I look at Buck's face, and there's depression there, yeah. and he doesn't know what to say or what to do because what can you do? You just grumble to yourself that this team sucks. It's just you say that over and over. I want to move on to basketball for a second, and uh, I watched uh, uh, Utah, and I have to tell you, Donovan Mitchell, new respect. The I truth. really, he is the truth, and. 38 points, and his battle with Westbrook in the third period was classic yesterday. Uh, it was just a, a great win for uh, Quinn Snyder, the former Dukey. A great job. I, I don't see, you know, they look, we're 0 4 against Houston this year. As good as Mitchell's been playing, if Rubio is out like he was last night, they don't have a prayer. It's going to be four games. Uh, Paul George, 2 for 16. Uh, playoff P was not there last night, all right? Carmelo Anthony has disappeared. Is this what Westbrook's history is to take other guys down? Westbrook had 48 points, but he shot 43 times. And in the last two games, he shot 92 times. And here's, here's the other thing. 19 threes he took. That's more than most teams taking a game. He personally took 19 threes. I, I, I don't know what they're going to do. Plenty of people thought that he cost them that game three after Ricky Rubio uh, had the triple-double on him, and, he's, and he came out after the game. He was like, well, that won't happen again. And he was too worried. with. Uh, he was too preoccupied. You, you saw the highlight of Mitt Romney on, on, on court side saying that he had four fouls, four fouls. And... This is something that we'll be talking about all offseason, Bruce, and we've been talking about it for two years now. Is Russell Westbrook worth dis- it? Yeah, despite how great of a player as he is, is he a great player at the expense of his teammates? Now, I think the whole players leaving and getting better thing is a little overblown. There's only one player who voluntarily left him, and that was Kevin Durant. But, you know, we'll see, man. All right. I don't know if Steph Curry's back yet. We don't know, but I do know this, all right. Uh, LeBron's not going to be beat in Game 7. And Philadelphia is the team to beat right now in the East. In the West, to me, it's Houston, depending on whether or not Curry comes back. But one thing I'll tell you, uh, Mr. Nike, is he a Nike uh, Kevin Durant? No. He, uh, Adidas? Yeah, I, be- I believe it, it's, it's either Nike or Adidas. It's certainly not Under Armour. It's not, not, Mr. Mr. Non-Under Armour cannot right. carry that team by himself to a championship. And that's a fact. Without Curry, they will not win, and they don't have much of a chance. So uh, Steph is the straw that stirs that team. He's the guy that makes it happen. And um, hopefully he comes back. All right, Maryland Hopkins, real quick. Uh, a win by Maryland will keep them on top of the RPI. A win by Hopkins will elevate them to a top four, most likely. The number one seed of the Big, to- uh, Big Ten tournament's on the line. The Big Ten regular season is on the line. The Crab Trophy is on the line. But most important, winning the rivalry game is on the line. Today is the biggest game in the Maryland and Johns Hopkins players history that they've played and if you don't believe me watch what happens to the team who wins today for the rest of the season you had both coaches on this team on this show a bunch of times both i like both the coaches yeah. i like both coaches i'm a maryland guy though but uh uh this is to me a crucial game thank you to science and kirk all for also for sponsoring us along with coons ford We'll be back Wednesday night to talk all things Hopkins and talk about the next Hopkins game next week in the Big Ten tournament. See you then. Have a great week. Go Terps. Let's have a great day at Johns Hopkins at Homewood.